Hello, and welcome back to The Haunted Beard. Today, we continue the Horror of David Lynch series with his 2001 film, Mulholland Drive, starring Naomi Watts, Laura Herring, and Justin Thoreau. Mulholland Drive is one of my all-time favorite movies. I think it is the definitive mystery movie. And it is one of the most well-thought-out, layered, atmospheric, surreal, and puzzling films I've ever seen, and I think it's a work of pure brilliance. When Mulholland Drive was released on DVD back in 2002, David Lynch included an insert in the DVD case with 10 clues to solving the mystery. Today, I want to explore those 10 clues, and then give my overall concluding thoughts on the film. Let's dive in. Clue number one. Pay particular attention in the beginning of the film. At least two clues are revealed before the credits. Later in the movie, we learn that Diane won a jitterbug contest, and the opening shows the memory of that contest. We see her in the spotlight, and this event caused her to want to come to LA to become an actor. Looking closely at this sequence, we also see that there are multiple copies of the same couples, which I believe gives us a clue to the dual identities of Naomi Watts' character, who starts the film as Betty and later on becomes Diane. The second clue is in a POV shot of someone in bed, seemingly waking up for a brief moment and then falling back asleep. I believe this to be Diane, as we see this bed with the red sheets later on in the film when in Diane's apartment. I interpret this scene to mean that we've now entered dream territory. The majority of this film is Diane's dream. I think in figuring out this first clue, it actually serves as a clue in and of itself to help us solve the remaining nine clues. We need to make the connection that we've entered dream territory in order to understand the significance of the other clues. Case in point. Clue number two. Notice the appearances of the red lampshade. If we don't figure out clue number one and realize we're in a dream, we won't understand the significance of the red lampshade. The first appearance of the red lampshade happens at the 18 minute 20 second mark, and the second appearance happens at the 2 hour 7 minute and 23 second mark. We are now back in the real world, and we discover that the lamp is in Diane's apartment. I believe the red lamp serves as a clue making a subconscious connection between Diane's dream and her reality. Clue number three. Can you hear the title of the film that Adam Kesher is auditioning actresses for? Is it mentioned again? We learn at the 85 minute mark that the title of Adam Kesher's film is The Sylvia North Story. It's only a few moments after this that we see Camilla Rhodes, the dream version, auditioning and Adam saying, this is the girl, signifying that Camilla is to get the lead role. The title is mentioned again at the two hour and 13 minute mark by Diane, this time in the real world. The Sylvia North story is significant because Diane met Camilla on the set of this movie. Diane auditioned for the lead, but Camilla was cast instead, and the director didn't think much of Diane. I believe this clue serves as another reference point between Diane's dream and her reality. In Diane's dream, her subconscious has come up with a reason why she didn't get this part. She had to leave the audition to help Rita, a very honorable and selfless act. Diane sees herself as the hero in her own mind. She also has fabricated some dark conspiracy that the entire casting of Camilla was manipulated, but more on that later. Her dream serves to justify her jealousy and resentment. She sees herself as such a good person and talented actress who, due to things beyond her control, never stood a chance to get the lead role, but in reality, she just wasn't good enough for the part. Clue number four. An accident is a terrible event. Notice the location of the accident. 
There are a couple ways to answer this clue. First, the accident happens in the front of the limo, or what would be called a head-on collision. Head being a key word. This collision is what starts Rita's amnesia, which is a key to the whole story, a story that involves memories and identity. Also, the limo was parked on the side of the road on Mulholland Drive. This is where Diane experienced her most traumatic moment, her own mental crash. Seeing that Camilla and Adam were in love and were going to get married. This is the event that triggers the events of the entire movie. I believe this is the moment where Diane decides that she is going to have Camilla killed. And also, it would be not long after this event where Diane would have her dream. Clue number five, who gives a key and why? At Winky's Diner, we see Diane has contacted a hitman to kill Camilla. The hitman gives Diane a key, a blue key to be exact, which is also another connection between the blue key with the blue box that we find in the dream world. Diane finds this key on her coffee table which signifies from the hitman that his job of killing Camilla has been completed. In the way the blue key in the dream world serves to open the box to reality, the blue key in the real world is a reminder that forces Diane to deal with the reality of her actions. Clue number six. Notice the robe, the ashtray, and the coffee cup. I believe the items in this clue are another example to show the connection between the real world and Diane's dream. We see each item twice, and I believe they are there to make a subconscious connection between these two realms. First, the robe. We see a pretty decorative robe that Aunt Ruth gives to Betty, but it is only ever worn by Rita. And we also see a dingy white robe being worn by Diane later in the film. In Diane's dream, she is a nice person, allowing Rita to wear her robe. But in reality, she's not this at all, and perhaps her dirty robe is a reflection of this. The ashtray is first seen by the red lamp earlier on in the film. We also see the ashtray later on in the movie, this time in the real world, and it's located in Diane's apartment on her coffee table. We see this during the scene when Camilla tells Diane they have to stop seeing each other. Coffee cups are seen multiple times throughout the film, if you include the ones seen at Winky's Diner. But I believe this clue is specifically in reference to the cup of espresso that's given to one of the Castigliano brothers during the production meeting earlier on in the movie. I always found this scene to be pretty funny. The total fear on the face of the waiter who serves it to him, the anxiety on the guy's faces before he drinks the coffee, and then the guy spitting out the coffee in pure disgust is pretty hilarious. We see this cup again towards the end of the movie. This time, in the real world, Diane is drinking coffee during the scene when Adam and Camilla announce their engagement. And we also see the Castigliano brother as well. I believe this to be just another connection linking the dream world with reality. Clue number seven. What is felt, realized, and gathered at the Club Silencio? We hear the words in Spanish, no hay banda, which means there is no band. It's all a tape. The performance and music is all an illusion. This scene is a great example of the barrier between perception and reality. This is Lynch telling the audience what you've just seen up until this point in the film is an illusion. Not only do we as the audience realize this, but Diane realizes this as well. There is a sound of what seems to be thunder and a flash of light and Betty begins to shake. She's starting to wake up. Then we see her and Rita crying during the performance of the song. I always found this to be such a powerful scene no matter how many times I watch it. I know it's just a recording, but the performance and the emotion of it still resonates, 
it feels real. Even though everything prior to this in the movie has been an illusion, it doesn't take away how it made us feel. We're still caught up in the experience and emotion of it all. It again feels real. The crying is Betty or Diane's realization that this beautiful reality is a dream and she knows she's going to have to wake up. It is here where the blue box appears and once it is opened, we exit the dream and Diane wakes up back in the real world. Clue number eight. Did talent alone help Camilla? My answer to this is that I don't believe so. I think her beauty and personality also played a significant role in landing Camilla the lead role in Sylvia North story. We also have the story involving the Castigliano brothers, the mafia type producers who are pulling the strings and calling the shots behind the scenes. However, this is the explanation Diane's dreaming mind comes up with as the reason why Camilla got the role and she did not. She sees herself as a victim of a corrupt system. This is perhaps a manifestation of her jealousy and resentment towards Camilla. In reality, I think Camilla was chosen not only because of her talent, but also because of her looks and personality. Clue number nine. Note the occurrences surrounding the man behind Winkies. The man behind Winkies appears three times during the film. The first appearance is about 15 minutes in. I've done an entire video on this scene. It is one of the greatest and most terrifying scenes I've ever seen. These lines delivered here. There's a man in back of this place. He's the one who's doing it. I can see him through the wall. Are truly haunting. And they also serve to get us thinking about the man behind Winkies and what he represents. He's the one who's doing it. He's the dream master. He's the evil that has set in motion and is controlling the entire story. We see him again at the 139 minute mark, right after Diane has hired the hitman. He's carrying the blue box and we see the elderly couple crawl out of it. I believe they are Diane's parents. We see a brief glimpse of them in the beginning during the jitterbug sequence and they represent her hopes and dreams which have now become corrupted. Diane realizes she's a failure. She will never attain the fame and success she wanted. The guilt she feels from letting her parents down, and now the guilt of killing Camilla, has personified itself and has come to torment her, ultimately to the point of suicide. We see the man a final time at the very end of the movie. Diane is now dead, but the evil still remains. The shot here is superimposed briefly over a cityscape shot of LA, or Hollywood. Diane is just one of its victims in this city. The man is alive and well and will move on to destroy another person's dreams and claim a new victim. Clue number 10. Where is Aunt Ruth? In the dream world, we see Aunt Ruth leaving her apartment, which is where Betty ends up staying. Betty says that Aunt Ruth has left for Canada and is working on the production of a movie. But in reality, we learn from Diane that Aunt Ruth has died some years ago. And learning this, it creates a puzzling question. Is the Aunt Ruth in Betty's dream the real Aunt Ruth? And if so, how do you explain her immediate return to her apartment after Betty and Rita open the blue box and disappear? Is this small scene still a dream? If it isn't, then this isn't Aunt Ruth because she's dead. If I'm being honest, I'm not really sure what the answer to this clue is. I think it's probably the most puzzling out of all ten of them. So what do all these clues mean? What's the answer to the mystery? This is the tragic story of a woman who moved to Hollywood in pursuit of a dream. While there, she fell in love, but the love wasn't returned, and her dreams failed. These things turned into a murderous combination of jealousy, resentment, and hatred, to where she ends up having the woman she loved killed. In an attempt to cope, she retreats into a dream of her own making, but she can't stay asleep forever. The growing and overwhelming guilt soon becomes too great a burden to bear, and she takes her own life. I don't suspect I'll ever have all the mysteries of Mulholland Drive solved, but this is what keeps me coming back. 
Mulholland Drive has one of the most uniquely structured stories, one of the scariest movie scenes, and one of the greatest acting performances I've ever seen in Naomi Watts. I don't use this term often, but Mulholland Drive is a masterpiece. Well, those are my thoughts. I probably missed some things, and if I did, or if you have a different interpretation, please let me know about it down below in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. If you like videos like this, please consider hitting that subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. Next up will be the concluding segment of the Horror of David Lynch series, and I'll be looking at his film from 2006, Inland Empire. I'll see you next time on The Haunted Beard.